Most people enjoy their continuing education requirements about as much as going to the dentist, but it has to be done. That's why you need to check out Empire Learning. Their whole focus is on making your CE experience easy. You won't believe how affordable your CE can be, especially from a company rated 4.8 out of 5 stars by thousands of other industry pros. They have an expert U.S.-based customer service team that can help with questions, and they report completed credits every business day so you can skip any last-minute heartburn with your license renewal. They're currently running a sale, so check out the link in the show notes, click on the state you're licensed in, and you can get started today. Make your CE easy with Empire Learning. Should I focus on new customers or should I continue to super serve my existing customers? The answer is yes. <laughs> yes, you should do both of those things. They are both important. And the reason is because you're going to get referrals, but not today. Welcome to the Mortgage Marketing Expert Podcast, where expert guests teach you how to have success in the mortgage and real estate industry. Here's your host, Phil Treadwell. All right. Welcome back to the podcast. I am your host, Phil Treadwell. Super excited about this conversation today. A repeat guest and one of my favorite people just in the world in general, Brittany Hodak. She's an award-winning entrepreneur, author, and customer experience speaker. She founded and scaled an entertainment startup to eight figures before exiting, and she's about to release her debut book, Creating Superfans, that comes out in January. So, she is a foremost expert on these things. And so I am super excited to have this conversation and share her with you again. Brittany, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you, my friend. I am so, so excited to be here. I think last time, I, this literally just popped in my head. The last time we had a conversation, I think we talked about your Guinness World Record. Am I imagining this? Do you have a Guinness no, we World Record? probably did, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure for about a month, I researched the easiest world records to break. And of course, when you Google that, those have already been broken because someone else has already Googled that and found that out. But I digress. I am still not a world record holder, but that's okay. That's There's always the, there's always the bucket list. <laughs> <laughs> so for anybody who did not hear that last episode or who has since forgotten, which would probably be anyone, I set a Guinness world record when I was in college. I created the world's largest Christmas stocking. So I designed it. I sewed it with a group of my friends. We filled it with about 13,000 toys for kids in need. So it was 57 feet tall and 27 feet from heel to toe and very, very wide. The circumference was crazy. It was like yeah. enormous. And it was a lot of fun to set that record and to get in the record book. And as you mentioned, I have a book coming out in January and my book is called Creating Superfans. And I thought, wow, what's a cool way to represent superfans? And I thought about foam fingers. And so there are actually existing Guinness World Records in place for the world's largest foam fingers. One of them was at the, I think it was the Rogers Center in Canada. They did it at a hockey game. And then I think like the Blue Jays also did it at some hockey game. So anyway, it's, I forget exactly how tall it was. It was like 20 feet tall or something. And I was like, oh, I could do that. <laughs> and I actually for a minute was looking into like foam fabrication and I was like, can I create the world's largest foam finger? And then I was like, this is insane. I need to just focus on telling people about my book and how it is the perfect guide to turn your customers into lifelong advocates rather than like trying to come up with a crazy stunt. But I did spend more than a little time Googling like how foam fingers are made and how <laughs> I can make one that would be, you know, the size of a three-story house and all of those other completely logical things that absolutely normal people do. Guys, if you want to know what experts and authors do in their spare time, you've just been given an insight <laughs> into what that is. <laughs> uh, so well, we were talking before we started recording, and I'm basically trying to think of like every guerrilla marketing tactic that I can to tell everyone in the world about this book, all the way down to like, I legit printed shirts with the cover that say, ask me about my book. And I'm going to just like wear them every day for the next three months. I made ones for my kids that say my mom wrote a book. I'm going to put them in them like every time they go outside. But I happen to be the four year running holiday lights champion in my HOA. And so I know there's going to be a lot of traffic for people coming to check out our light display to see if we can retain the crown and win for the fifth year in a row. So I just 
designed like a big yard sign, like the, you know, realtors or politicians use. I just designed it last night and it says, if you like the lights, you'll love my new book. And it's the cover and a QR code. And I'm going to put it in our driveway with like lights around it and shine a spotlight on it. So, so and I don't know, maybe nobody will, will scan the QR code and, and order a book or maybe like lots of people will, but nobody's going to do it if I don't, if I don't create that opportunity. So. Well, that is by far my favorite. And my mind started racing with different opportunities of shit that I can put behind a QR code on a sign <laughs> in my front yard. <laughs> because we we live kind of at the front of of our subdivision, so people kind of drive straight in. Like we're the first ones that door knockers and solicitors hit and whatnot. So I need to like put a if if nothing else for all the people that are coming to sell their their useless crap to me, they can scan my QR code on the way in way out. I just got to figure out what I got to put on the end of that QR code first. So. Uh, I know what it needs to say. It needs to say, my friend wrote a book, exclamation <laughs> with a picture of That's creating right. super fans, how to turn your customers into lifelong advocates and a QR code that takes them to the retailer of their choice. That's right. All of my, all of my call to actions in the short term are going to be a link to creating super fans <laughs> on amazon.com. If you go to creatingsuperfans.com, you can find all of your favorite retail parties. <laughs> what else do we have for them, Bob? <laughs> oh, into- <laughs> look, behind door number three, it's more <laughs> copies of the book. <laughs> now, people that are listening are either laughing their butt off along with us or like, Phil, would you just get to the conversation? So for those people, the, the the party poopers of the world, let's talk about super fans for a second, because you, I got a cool advanced copy of the book. And as I've been reading through it, I love how you're framing this. Super fans are people that are going to be your advocates. Those are the people that are going to be helping you create more fans. And in these first couple of chapters, you also talk about apathy, which I heard you talk about one of the very first keynotes that I that I heard you gave. So I knew I threw a lot at you there, but what I want to want you to, to kind of lead into this conversation is just talking about number one, what a super fan is, why it's important for anyone who is in sales, marketing, branding, at all. Any any business needs to have super fans. And then this topic of apathy, what happens if they find you, they see you, they engage with you and still don't care. So I just want to like kind of set all that stuff up for you and just kind of let you run with it. Okay, great. Well, thank you. A super fan is a customer who comes back and tells their friend. So they're loyal, enthusiastic advocates. And the reason they're important is because Super fan customers are the only thing that future proof your business. They are what takes you from a potential commodity in the minds of everyone else to a category leader or a category of one, especially if you compete in an industry who has a lot of other people who do something very similar or exactly the same as what it is that you do. So that's the reason that they're important. And the reason that I talk about apathy and and apathy is kind of the the opposite of super fandom is because a lot of times people tell me they have an awareness problem. Not enough people know what it is that they do. And in reality, it's oftentimes not an awareness problem. It's an apathy problem. Plenty of people know, and they just don't care because you haven't given them a reason to. Mm -hmm. So they may understand who you are. They may even understand the industry you're in, what it is that you do. But if you haven't connected your story to theirs in a way that they can understand and repeat to somebody else, then it's still never going to be relevant. It's never going to stop them from scrolling. It's never going to get their attention. And when it comes time for them to engage with someone who does what you do, maybe they'll think of you or maybe they won't. Because if you haven't found a way to vanquish that apathy, you're not going to be top of mind. You're not going to be the one that they're thinking of. And you're certainly not going to be the one that they tell their friends about when they're in an opportunity to tee up a referral or an introduction. There's two parts of this that I think people get caught up in, especially in mortgage and real estate, of this dilemma between do I go after new potential people to add to my network or do I continue to engage with and service and create value for people that are already in my existing network? So what would your answer to that be? When I was like four or five, my favorite thing to watch was this like ridiculously outdated TV show. Now I found it on YouTube for my kids a couple years ago. My husband was like, what is this? Do not ever play this again. It was called We Sing in Sillyville. Do you know what We Sing in Sillyville is? Do you remember that? I do not. 
Okay. It was like a woman who went and she got like sucked into a coloring book somehow. And she had her dog and there were some kids and they had to like bring all the colors back. Super creepy, like watching it as an adult. But as a kid, one of the songs that they sang in We Sing in Sillyville over and over is one that I'm sure that you've heard and I'm sure you listening have heard. And it says, make new friends, but keep the old. One is, what is it, Phil? Do you know? Mm Mm-mm. Oh, I thought, I thought maybe everybody knew the song. Okay, oh. maybe 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 this was a We Sing in Sillyville original. I don't know. The song says, make new friends, but keep the old. One is silver and the other gold. It's gold. I actually and have I heard that expression. You have? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So the same is true for customers, right? So when people say, should I focus on new customers or should I continue to super serve my existing customers? The answer is Yes. <laughs> yes, you should do both of those things. They are both important. And the reason is because you're going to get referrals, but not today. You're going to get repeat business, but not today. You've got to stay focused on the long-term plan while you also focus on the, the more immediate. So, you know, just like a football team is going to have a hard time winning without great offense, great defense, and a great special teams team, you've got to be great at recruiting new customers and you've got to be great at taking care of your existing customers. And I always encourage people to think about their transactions with their existing customers in three distinct phases before, during, and after. Like the before is your reputation, your content that you're posting, everything that you're doing to tee up a great first call, right? It's like how they're judging you, whether they find you on a Google search, whether they randomly stumble across an ad, or whether a friend says, hey, check this person out, and they go check you out. Like the before is what they see before they talk to you. The during is the actual deal phase. So like if you're in real estate or mortgage, it's when you're helping somebody buy or sell that home. Everything from, hey, I need a new house to, hey, let's high five because it's closing day. And that's unfortunately where a lot of people sort of look at the end of the relationship, but that's not the end of the relationship. The biggest and I think most important phase of that entire relationship timeline is the third part, which is after. So if you're focusing disproportionately on the during phase, which is what a lot of people do, you are losing so many opportunities for repeat business and for referral business because people are going to forget about you, right? They're going to forget or they're going to think, well, that was unremarkable and not tell their friends. So yes, you need to be constantly looking for new customers. Yes, you need to be constantly thinking about the top of your your funnel or the top of your pipeline or however you think about it. But you absolutely also need to be nurturing your relationship because, you know, everybody has heard the saying, your network is your net worth. And it's true. Like you've got to maintain those relationships. If you want to have customers who say, I want to work with you, they don't want to work with somebody who does what you do. They want to work with you. So many times we try to segment it. And so I love that you're like, no, it's not an or, it's an and. You need to do both. And there's two different pieces to that process, if you will. In your book, you talk about exceeding expectations. And I want you to talk about that just for a minute, because in our industry, we have a, I think, a fallacy that because we're not the quintessential push button, get mortgage, that we actually had a conversation or two with them, that that's not adding a ton of value because we're we're unfortunately just a conversation or two away from being that easily replaced fintech platform. What are some things that you would recommend people do to exceed expectations either during the transaction or as they're continuing to maintain that relationship? I would say one thing that you can do is really ask your customers what they need. Like there's a really great Teddy Roosevelt quote, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And there are some customers who would never be comfortable using a fintech solution. There are others who would probably honestly rather use a fintech solution, right? And then the vast majority of people are kind of somewhere in the middle. They don't know what they don't know. They need someone to explain this to them because they don't know the difference between FHA and VA and all the other acronyms. And they're like, wait, what is this? What does this mean? What conventional, what non-conventional, like what, what are you talking about? And so you've got to 
educate them, but you've got to do it in a way that doesn't seem like they're just another loan for you or just another house to be sold or another house to be bought. If you're on the realtor side, like they're a person whose future and financial freedom you care about. And I think one of the biggest opportunities to add value, we've all heard the stat that on the mortgage side, something like 80% of people go to a different borrower for their next loan. And I think part of that reason is because so many people look at their job and mortgage as just getting you that first loan. And then it's like, you're done. It's like you disappear, right? You kind of ghost your customers. And what does the customer remember? They remember that they signed a bunch of paperwork with you for a relationship that they thought was going to be a 15 year or a 30 year relationship. And then all of a sudden they get some paperwork in the mail one day that's like, Hey, your loan has been bought. You have a different mortgage company now. And they're like, wait, what does this mean? What happened? Did I do something wrong? And then they get 50 postcards and flyers and letters in the mail from different companies that are talking about that loan and referencing the name of your company. And they're like, are these a scam? Are they real? Wait, did my lender send this or did someone else send this? What, how, why didn't I know any of this was going to happen? And meanwhile, that originator has moved on. A lot of times their realtor has moved on. And so you've got someone who's confused about not only what this whole process is that is now happening, but also irritated because no one told them it was coming. So I, one of my like huge pet peeves with the mortgage industry is that people are called loan originators. Like that is a terrible title and we need to get rid of it because it literally says your job is to start a loan. Like, no, your job is not to originate loans. Your job should be to be the partner and the advisor for your client forever, right? right? That is what your job should be. Like your job is to help them understand their loan, let them know exactly what's going to happen before, during, and after closing, and then be there as somebody that they can come to with their questions when all of these things start to happen. And they're like, wait, didn't I just create like a login and a password for this mortgage company? Like, what does it mean? Somebody else has my loan now. What is that? I don't understand it. So understanding that these complexities that maybe to somebody who has been in the industry for 10 years are like, you could do them in your sleep. But for somebody who's buying their first home or for somebody who hasn't bought a home in 40 years and now they're selling their home and dealing with this all over again, like you've got to put yourself in your customer's shoes. You've got to think about that. And going back to that Teddy Roosevelt quote, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Like you've got to prove that you care about them as a person and as a family and not just a commission check or basis points. It's so true. And and the only way to show them that is to have a conversation and ask questions about them. We list off all of these features, but we don't talk about the benefit to them. And the reason we don't describe the benefit to them is because we don't know what benefit to provide because we've not stopped to ask the questions and, and have those things there. And I love what you said about not just starting a loan. We should be the loan advisor, the loan partner forever. And if mortgage professionals will catch that we're in the most unique position to do that, it'll change people's lives, both clients and people in the business. Financial advisors know someone's assets, right? CPAs know their income. Credit bureaus know their debt. We're one of the few industries that knows all of it. We know what their income, their assets, their their credit, their debt. We, We have it all, which means we're in a unique position to really help advise them on how they can take this financial journey that people don't love to talk about, that don't love to have, and there's a way to do it in a very realistic way. And I think if we can encapsulate those things, we end up with exactly what your book is about, which is a super fan. And then you don't have to worry about all these tactical marketing things and how to get more engagement and how to grow your network because you have an army of people that are out there singing your praises and talking about how you exceeded their expectations, how you did something that nobody else did. And I say it over and over and over, The reason when you go to a cocktail party or your kid's sporting event and someone finds out you're in the mortgage business and the first question they ask is, well, what are rates doing right now is our fault because we've not given them anything else to talk about or anything else to understand the value that we provide than whatever rate sheets on that chart that particular day. Exactly. Customers don't know what they don't know. And to be in a position to where you can say, 
that is one very small piece of the picture. Let me tell you about all of the things that matter so much more. And by the way, are rates a little bit higher right now? Yeah, they're a little bit higher right now, but that's why I'm going to be here to help you refi in a few years. So let's talk about right now, because the reality is if you don't get a place, you're paying 100% interest on that rent that you've got. So let's figure out a great solution for you. And then a few years from now, we'll take advantage of whatever's going on at that time. But I'm here to help you you with, you know, X, Y, and Z in the meantime, and don't worry about the rates. That's one tiny part of it. What I'm worried about is your financial freedom. What I'm worried about is the wealth that we're building for you and your children and how we're going to do that in the way that's going to make the most sense for you right now. Big picture. Love that. So I want to talk about the book for a second and, and how some of these topics that you're talking about. And, and as I'm skimming through here, I'm not going to ask all the questions that I want to ask because they got to go buy the book. They, they need to get the book. There is so much great information here. Just in the first portion of it that I've been through, it's absolutely incredible and is even going to change some things the way that we run our business. But I want you to talk for a second just what that journey has been because I think it's fascinating. Some people wake up one day and say, hey, I'm going to write a book and they download everything and, and they have a book. And then some people have a more methodical process. And so I'd like to talk about just what your journey has been and, and what was your inspiration and your why behind even putting Putting this all together. So I've been joking the past few months. Every time somebody tells me that they want to write a book, my response is, have you thought about starting a podcast? Because yeah. you could also start a podcast <laughs> because it was hard. Like writing a book is no joke, right? And there are a lot of different paths that people take. I have wanted to be an author since I was a little girl, right? Like I loved books. When I was a little kid, I didn't fall asleep with stuffed animals or dolls. I fell asleep with books. Like I asked for books for every birthday. My mom would drive me to the library like every day. We could get 25 books at a time. I would check out 25 books. I would try to read them all before the next day. Like I was such a, a bookworm as a kid. Probably Book It helped. Remember Book It? We should get people. That's what I should do. I should buy a pizza for everybody who reads my book. That I'm going to do that. I'm going to have Brittany's book it. Talk yeah, about these guerrilla tactics. Like I'm telling I'm you, I'm going to try to set up a deal with Pizza Hut on that. So that is that is what I'm going to do. Anybody listening to this, if you pre-order my book, just email me. Brittany at BrittanyHodak.com and I will buy you a pizza because I think that was like a really great way to get kids to read. So let's see if it still works for adults. <laughs> the path for me was quite long. I had been keynote speaking for a while and people kept saying to me, this has to be a book. This has to be a book. Please write a book. And so I started my book in like February of 2020. <laughs> And I thought this will be perfect because my second son was due in May of 2020. And I was like, oh, I'm going to be off the road for March and April. I'll just write my book. And then, of course, COVID happened. So I did not finish this book until the end of 2021 because I was writing it with two little ones at home and I wanted to make it perfect. And a lot of times people will like hire ghostwriters or hire co-authors to help them with their books. And there's nothing at all wrong with that. I just didn't want to do it because to me, it was important to be able to say I wrote every single word in this book. And so I finished the draft at the end of 2021. And then I went through months and months of revisions. I had never worked with a professional publishing company before. So it was three rounds of what they call substantive edits with an editor who came in and sort of helped with like big picture stuff. And then it was three rounds of edits with a copy editor who kind of is working on like sentence and paragraph structure of like, oh, this thing you talk about in chapter seven reminds me of this thing in chapter 22. Should we tie them together somehow? Or maybe we should move this example from chapter nine to chapter 13, or think about the way we do this differently, or in my instance. So every chapter in my book is a song title and several of the headings were song titles, but not all of them. And she came back and said, I think every H1 heading, which is like the main headings. So like the section headers, like let's make those be song titles, but all the H2 headers, let's have those not be song titles because then when somebody's reading, it'll be a really natural way for them to like orient themselves as they go through the book. Like they'll understand when a main section has changed because there's a new song title. And it, when she said that to me, I was like, yeah, I don't, I thought maybe overthinking it. I don't know if people are going to do it, but I trusted her and we made that change and it made such a difference in the way the book reads and feels. 
So anyway, there were three rounds with that editor. And then there were three rounds with a proofreader who did all of the like fact checking, coming back saying like, oh, you have this movie quote, but like this one little word is different. Or, oh, you like reference this from whatever, but like this was the English translation and we should go with the original Spanish translation because this was written like in Spain in 1750 or whatever. So anyway, just like crazy, crazy level. So I finished the draft in December, 2021. The book went to print at the end of September of 2022. So it was going through edits for that long, that many phases, nine rounds of text edits, like complete total rounds, printing out 300 pages every time, reading it really closely. And then like three rounds of visual art rounds. So figuring out how to make it look more beautiful, what we wanted to highlight as pull quotes, what we wanted to do as graphic pages, the little quotes at the beginning of every chapter, which I learned are called epigraphs, all of the things. So yes, for me, it was a very long journey. But the fun part is that I've been able to market it all along the way. So I've pre-sold a ton of copies. I've been able to like share really fun parts of it with people. And I am just so, so excited for it to be out in the world. Well, I'm excited to have the physical copy because I have the digital copy. We're going to have a link to your book in the show notes. Everybody needs to go pre-order a copy. This book is going to help your business and you need to understand that these things are very, very practical. We're talking about how to take the people that already like you, the no like and trust strategy, right? They already know you, they already like you, they already trust you. How you can take that to a next level to find more people in a very easy way. That's much easier than coming up with with a content strategy or marketing strategy or, or all these different things. So you, you need to get this book. It is well worth it. We talk about a lot of things in here, not to take away from any other authors or any other books that we've showcased on here, but this is one that uh, that I'm definitely going to urge everyone to, to go click the link of. So we'll have that in the show notes there. Brittany, as always, you're an incredible guest. I want to ask you one last question. Uh, We've asked you this before and we ask our guests all the time. And that's it. If you could just give one tip to professionals today to go out to use to build their business, what would it be? My tip is to follow the platinum rule and that is treat others the way they want to be treated. Do that and you'll be creating super fans without even trying. Uh, I love that one. Brittany, we appreciate you. Appreciate you being here. Excited about your book. This was, I guess, the second of many and uh, excited to have you back on and talk about subsequent books and how you're now a Wall Street Journal bestselling author and how uh, you're just taking over the world with creating super fans. Hey, I love it. I'm here. And maybe one of these days I'll get around to launching my own podcast and you can come be a guest. (laughs) (laughs) Would love to. Would love to. Awesome. Well, I look forward to catching up again soon. Thank you, my friend. So good to talk to you. You as well. Thank you for joining us. This is the Mortgage Marketing Expert Podcast. 